Ja, meine sehr verehrten Damen und Herren, Ladies and Gentlemen, Publikum, ich freue mich, dass Sie hier so zahlreich erschienen sind. Such a pleasure to see so many of you in Herren the audience today. Panel. Gentlemen on the panel, I'd like to welcome you warmly to our open forum this afternoon on religious tensions and uh, overcoming them in Since ancient times, many uh, philosophers, Plato included, have pronounced that it's not possible to live uh, happily and peacefully in a community unless we have common values, unless we have uh, some kind of social cement holding us together. So today our discussion is what holds Europe together and specifically to what degree can religion be the glue that holds us together as a society? Can, religious, can religions help us move forward, or do they constitute a threat to social cohesion and harmony? That is the subject of our discussion. Um, I have the great pleasure of uh, introducing my illustrious panel, uh, many individuals with uh, significant uh, cultural and uh, religious background. On my far right, Rabbi Pinches Goldschmidt, Rabbi President of the European Conference of Rabbis. <laughs> So, um, maybe, maybe not your far right, uh, your, uh, your um, extreme. Uh, right. well, maybe you've, got the wrong, you've got the wrong signs next to your seat, so the best thing to do is just to change seats. Ich könnte mich jetzt hier insofern rausschwatzen, als ich sagen würde, das ist doch ein schönes Beispiel dafür, well, dass man auch Hüte wechseln kann, dass wir alle flexibel sind und durchaus in der Lage, uns in die anderen hats, Religionen hineinzuversetzen. Uh, also insofern, noch einmal, Herr Rabbi Pinchas Goldschmidt, so, schön, dass Sie hier sind so, uh, uh, und in den Sessel jetzt, uh, Vorsitzender der Europäischen Rabbiner-Konferenz right und der uh, oberste Rabbiner in Moskau. Uh, President of the European Conference of Rabbis. Dann Amar Khaled, Stiftungsratspräsident der Right Star Foundation International, ist darüber hinaus ein Rights Star Äußerst Foundation. He's a much loved and well known television preacher in the Arab countries. Welcome. Herr Minister Espen Minister Espen Bal Eide is Minister of Defence in Norway. I'd like to wish you a warm welcome as well. And on my left side, I believe this is correct, Hamid Shadi, Director of Research at the Brookings Doha Centre in Qatar. And he's particularly involved with the political landscape and democratisation in Arab countries. And the Arab world. And welcome to you. And then Gottfried Locher, who's president of the uh, president of the Council of the Federation of Swiss Protestant Churches, and a vicar. Ja, ich habe es bereits angetönt, es soll heute nicht so, primär um die Probleme gehen, also nicht darum, dass wir outset, hier diskutieren, was sind diese Spannungen, die wir überwinden wollen, really sondern eben über what die Überwindung. Es soll um die Lösungen gehen. Dennoch wissen wir alle, man kann Probleme nicht lösen, wenn wir nicht die Probleme zuerst And verstehen. Deswegen möchte ich doch zuerst that, in einer kurzen Runde über die Spannungen in Europa sprechen. The problem is. So, to begin with, I'd like ich möchte to talk damit about anfangen, the dass ich Herrn Schadi die Frage Maybe stellen möchte. With you, Mr. Shadi. Wie es eigentlich für ihn war, wie es Sie es ähm, erlebt haben, als 2010 in Deutschland ein Buch erschienen ist, das für in 2010 Furore, für Wirbel gesorgt in, hat. Das ist das uh, Buch von Tilo Germany, Sarasin. Sie haben bestimmt Tilo schon mal davon gehört. Sure Mit dem Titel Deutschland author, schafft sich ab. In diesem Buch uh, hat Tilo Sarasin die These vertreten dass aufgrund der mangelnden Integration Muslim immigrants and that this was a massive threat to German prosperity. It was a cause of a great controversy in Germany. Was it a surprise for you, Mr. Shadi? Well, I think what we're seeing I think what we're seeing is the mainstreaming of anti-Muslim prejudice um, in Germany, but also throughout Europe. It's no longer just the right-wing populist parties that are engaging in this sort of rhetoric. And, um, but we're seeing it across the political spectrum from leading intellectuals, from leading authors, 
from the mainstream political parties, center right, center left as well. And I think that's one of the really worrying trends going forward is that it's no longer just the, um, the, the refuge of the fringe, but it's becoming something broader. I think what we are seeing though is what I would describe as a clash of values. And I don't think that we should discount this. There, is, there are major differences in Europe about the role of religion in the public sphere. And the Muslim minority um, has a different way of looking at religion than the vast majority of the rest of Europe. So when, when, when non-Muslim Euro Europeans talk about, um, when they talk about secularism, they feel that that's value neutral, that that gives everyone the right to practice their religion, but only in the private sphere, where I think with a lot of Muslims, and not a majority, but certainly a significant portion of Muslims in Europe, they believe that their religion gives them the right to express that in the public sphere. So I think those are two very different ways of, of approaching um, religion in the public sphere. And um, I'll just also say this, that I think there is something about Islam, the way it's currently constructed, that makes it more resistant to secularization. And there have been attempts throughout centuries to relegate Islam into the private sphere, but it's failed time and time again. So the question is, I think, is Europe going to be able to accommodate those types of religious sentiments in the public sphere? And I think the jury's still out, and that's where we're seeing so much of this tension emerging. Vielen Dank. Herr Locher, Many im Grunde genommen ist das Locher. ja ein Thema, das die Schweiz extrem betrifft. Is this a problem which Switzerland is extremely affected by? Die anti uh, we've had angenommen. the anti-minarets law uh, passed in a referendum in Switzerland or the initiative uh, for that. So do you believe this is an extreme <coughs> problem in Switzerland? Well, I think we've heard um, a very concise explanation of the problem. It's the integration of a religion which has a public dimension, which has a scale of values, uh, which has uh, principles about living together in community. And this religion is coming into contact with another religion, which has other principles. There's some overlap, but uh, certainly not everything uh, is the same. So there are frictions, and this relates not only to a small political minority, it relates to large parts of our society. Therefore, we need to take it seriously. If we're thinking about solutions, yes, we do need to address the uh, sources of tension. Those of you who grew up in Switzerland are familiar with these tensions. They're not that new. In uh, 1847, we had a religious war here. We know what religion, religious tensions can lead to. So let's remember our own history and then move on and address the issues peacefully. Es gibt diese Spannung, die so Frage ist ja you immer, are saying that the tensions exist, the question is, eminent, sind are die they inherent die da heraus, in religions, die or kreiert, are these tensions being intentionally, purposefully uh, und, und created, caused, und used by certain parties? Perhaps I should turn to you, uh, Minister Norwegen Eiger. In Norway, there was a devastating Sommer, event this summer. I think we can all remember the terrible incidents. An individual shot around 80 people. And this act was the act of a radical individual. However, it was oriented against Islamic philosophy. Where does Norway stand today? And how would you address this issue of tensions and what tensions are there? As you can all imagine, it was an, an incredible shock that this kind of thing could happen in a, in a normally very peaceful society who looks upon itself as highly tolerant and, and multiculturally uh, open. And uh, this, of course, was a far-right, white supremacist, uh, a former member of a political party who, had, who is anti-immigrant, but he left the party because he wanted to be far more anti-immigrant than the party was, and who decided to kill a lot of people uh, who were not necessarily immigrants, but people who he saw as representatives of 
tolerance and multiculturalism, which was what he was fighting. So it was sort of the, the center of the, the government, the main government building, the prime minister's office and several other ministries, and the, uh, uh, and the political summer camp of the social democratic youth movement. And the, the stated purpose, because in this case we know exactly what he meant by it, because he wrote a big book on the internet which he published an hour before the crime, was exactly that he has to do this because he has to defend against this multi multicultural tolerance which has no values because it doesn't sort of stick to the traditional Christian purity. Uh, no, this was a solo terrorist. We have found no direct political links, although there are a lot of intellectual connections to other, other people. But what it led to in our society was a very strong focus on doing what we think is the right thing to do when we are exposed to ter terrorism, is not to allow ourselves to be terrorized, not to change in the direction that the terrorist wants, but rather in the opposite direction. So the collective call of the political leadership as much as the people in general and of all the political parties was more tolerance, more unity, more democracy, more openness. And let's try to look into, you know, how can we strengthen the values of unity and diversity, which we think as Europeans and as Norwegians is what holds us together. Because the future as we see it has to be in one way or the other a multicultural society. Uh, and, and that requires a set of tolerance skills. Uh, and, and one of my challenges here, and, I'll, and I'm here, is that I think religious leaders uh, of all uh, faiths has the responsibility in help creating the civic culture, which makes it possible to coexist, and, and not only coexist, but have a mutual tolerance of the different faiths. And I think that, paradoxically, the outcome of this terrible terrorist attack is that there is more focus on this in Norway in a positive sense. So if one thing was achieved, it was that the terrorist really failed in trying to move society in the direction of purity that he was hoping. There are two points there. Um, interestingly, on one hand, there's this matter of unity in diversity, uh, the thing that brings us together. And then, on the other hand, you have the issue of tolerance, the recognition that there are differences and that, that, that needs to be recognized. European tradition, and I see us, Norwegians and Swiss, and everyone is part of a broad European tradition inspired by enlightenment which is very much that what, what makes us unique is our openness and tolerance and willingness to allow others. I'm not saying that other parts of the world doesn't have the same. Actually, on the contrary, a lot of the emerging powers that we're now seeing and which we're discussing a lot in World Economic Forum are highly multicultural societies with a high, with a high social capital of tolerance. But, but there is something European about this which we have to cherish because if we move in the opposite direction and try to look for something absolutely pure and original, mm -hmm. First, we won't find it, and on the way to that quest, we will, uh, we will achieve a lot of conflict and trouble. Herr Abi Goldschmidt, mich würde interessieren, wie Sie Herr die Situation Goldschmidt, aus I'd be interested on how you would see that from sagen, your Spannung. religious community. Where would you say the tensions arise? I would like, uh, first of all, <coughs> to say Grüezi. It's great to be back in Switzerland. Um, but uh, you'll allow me to speak in English, to respond in English, since I've, it has been over 30 years since I've been away. I would like to defer a little bit and say that um, the problem is not in Europe, is not between religions. It's basically between an enlightened uh, secular society and a religion which comes from another part of the world. And uh, if we take a look at statistics, um, a Catholic newspaper in France, La Croix, said that 64% of French are Catholics, which is about 41.6 million people. 4.5%, which is about 1.9 million people, go to church regularly. There are 6 million Muslims in France 45% say they practice, which is 2.5 million people, meaning the more people going to a mosque in France than going to church in France. The same is true in England. You have 930,000 Muslims going to the mosque on a weekly basis. You have only 916,000 Anglicans who go to church. So you have here a tension between a uh, postmodern secular Europe and um, um, 
immigrants or who have come with a very strong religious identity. Now, one of the knee-jerk um, responses was like here in Switzerland, the idea to circumcise masks, or what um, Wilder's party is doing in Holland. And uh, by the way, uh, the terrible terrorist attack you had in uh, Norway, the person was inspired by Wilder's. Such a terror attack does not happen out of nowhere. There has to be always uh, some kind of uh, support for such a terrible act. Is to attack uh, the Muslim religion, which we, from our Jewish perspective as a minority, we are the world's biggest experts of su in surviving as a minority. <laughs> We're ready to share our expertise with our Muslim brothers here in Europe as well. So I think that this reaction of uh, attacking the freedom of religion, of masks, of the way women wear clothes in the streets, and the latest attack has been in Holland of uh, also attacking what is on your plate, what kind of meat is on your plate outlawing uh, halal and kosher meat. And this attack has been against all minorities. So I think it is not in the spirit of Europe. If uh, Europe wants to keep its uh, identity, its uh, identity as uh, European Union, or as um, uh, it was said, that Europe is a, is a collective union of minorities, so we have to integrate and to teach each, each other tolerance. I hate the word intolerance. I hate the word tolerance. I think we should not only tolerate each other, we should respect each other. And uh, we should respect each other's secularism and religiosity. And I think a very important part of this is to, that the clergy mm. should be trained in Europe. They should come and have European values. This is extremely important. Education is important. And those who transgress, who, who terrorize other minorities should be punished. But the religion as it is should never be attacked and freedom of religion should be one of the last holy ideas which exist in Europe should be kept. Vielen Dank. Sie haben jetzt schon mit den Lösungen angefangen. Oder Thank you very much. You certainly began to address the solutions and particularly education of individuals would be useful. I'd like to come back to one point you made, saying that the tension isn't really between the religions, but between secular society and the religious society. Mr. Khaled, would you support that view expressed by Mr. Goldschmidt, that the tension doesn't exist really between the religions, but rather between uh, the secular society and the religious society. And I prefer to, to, to give you um, my idea about how uh, Muslims think about uh, coexistence, about uh, what they can do in, uh, in, in Europe. So first of all, uh, Islam, uh, is Islam accept coexistence as an as idea? I believe as a Muslim, that yes, Islam accept this, and it's very clear in many verses of uh, Quran, like we created you in different colors, different cultures, different religions, to accept, to exchange benefits through each other. It's part of our religion. And uh, through my, my Facebook page, we, we have four million youth in, in my page. We ask them, is coexistence, is, is is good is is good for our future? Do you believe in coexistence? And I got, I got more than eighty percent of these four millions. Yes, yes, they saying yes. We accept, and it's part of our understanding to the civilization, to the religion. So, when we talk about the theory, they believe. But let's come to to the practical life. Practical life, in my opinion, nothing can make the people understand each other like to meet each other, to, to work with each other, to find a practical projects 
doing with each other. If we stay talking about Muslims and you cannot find a chick hand with the one of them or sit or eat or uh, play football together or work together, it will still in our minds, you are something, me, myself. Before I stayed in UK, big difference between my understanding to the Western people when I was saying, staying in Egypt and then after I come to UK. When the people meet, when they smile, when they think together, when they work together. And I have an example. Uh, do you remember the cartoon crisis in Denmark? Most of Muslims did many demonstrations in our countries and so on, so I don't want to talk about this, but in, in our organization we said that the practical and the right way to go to Denmark to meet the youth. Let's talk 40 of our youth and going to Denmark to make dialogue. This is the right way. And we stayed there for three days. I have a joke that one of the Danish uh, ladies, when one of the Muslims uh, girl coming from Saudi Arabia came with us, when she saw her bag, she was uh, scared. Is there a bomb in her, in, in her bag? And, and after three days, they hugged each other. And they cried when they left. And I, I know some of them still in monthly emails together. This is the human part. And the social part is more important, in my opinion, than the ideologies. Ideologies, it's your idea, I will respect it. And my idea, you will respect it. But once we meet, once we work together, big difference will happen as a human. This is, this is my opinion. Das ist eine wunderbare Ansicht. Just well, that's, a, ist die, that's, that's, that's a wonderful yeah. view. Ist sie nicht ein bisschen zu positiv? Is it perhaps not a little bit um, too positive, too optimistic? Locher, we um, heard uh, Mr. Locher speak on this earlier. Maybe you'd like to come back on that. Well, I don't know whether it's, it's too positive because it's the only way. We have to meet. It doesn't begin with a philosophical approach. It doesn't begin uh, with a religious right, it must begin by sitting down, eating together, meeting each other, uh, educating our children in school together. That's where it has to begin. We have a Council of Religions in Switzerland for a number of years now, where religious leaders can try to do that, eat together, talk, share a little bit of our lives together. And here perhaps there's a concern because when we do that, we can see that in some ways there are differences. The, the way in which, for example, we let women participate in these discussions, that is different. That's not only different between uh, religions, it's different between certain denominations. We have to recognize that even when we come together, there are significant problems. So if we're talking about tolerance, uh, we must have credibility and honesty together with that. Tolerance is fine if everybody comes together for half an hour and then goes back to their world, but tolerance without honesty goes nowhere. I, th I think that that's a very important point because we have to be honest about that. And of course, the cartoon crisis illustrated one of the, you know, one of the limits of tolerance because most Europeans and, and, and Danes and Norwegians and Swiss would, would say that the, the, uh, there is an absolute right to make to draw whatever you like as a part of the right of expression. That's sort of sacrosanct in the postmodern uh, civic society, in a sense. It's, it's something you cannot violate. We, we do not tolerate people who violate the principle. Then you can say and write and do practically what you, what you want, particularly as long as it's not incitement to terrorism, for instance. That we all have certain rules. And then on the inside of you know, the, 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 the logic of many Muslims, not necessarily everyone, but many Muslims, there are certain things you can't do, like making this particular drawing of the Prophet, mm -hmm. which is also absolute and sacrosanct, and you can't, you know, you can't deviate from that. And here, you know, we want to be respectful and tolerant, but these two, they don't match 100%. You can do a lot of things to increase understanding, 
to reduce the problem, but you can't really sort of square the circle. Uh, and and uh, and uh, but 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 the second best, what you can do is to have a lot of co contact dialogue, explain to each other why this is an issue, why is this so important for me, why is this so important for you, yes. and then uh, eventually end up by saying that we disagree, but we still respect you. Uh, although the two logics do not completely uh, connect. And I think the, the, the rabbi's point is, is very good that the, the, it is not necessarily a question about you know, the, the natural essence of religions, but that many of the people who practice Islam in many European countries come directly from what, don't get me wrong, but what some people would call the pre-modern societal setting into a sort of uh, postmodern uh, societal setting and that, uh, and if they came from some, if they came from an urban setting, a, a, a modern Muslim urban setting, they would come with a different set of interpretations of what the religions mean than if they come from, uh, you know, the uh, Punjabi countryside, for instance. And 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 this is our issues that we have to deal with. I think they can be dealt with, but we have to sort of have them on the table as a reality. And if I could just jump in, um, when I hear the word dialogue, I mean, it always sounds very nice, but I, I'm also skeptical. And just to build on some of the previous comments, um, I, I think Amr made an important point saying that others have to respect each other's ideologies. But the problem is, um, are, are Europeans comfortable with the idea when um, a French Muslim woman says, I believe that God has obligated me to cover my hair, or God has obligated me to cover my face using the face veil. And if you look at the polling, um, a, a majority in many of these countries simply don't respect that idea. So the question is, how, how are Europeans going to accommodate themselves to these types of ideas, which to them are, are offensive? And this is just one example uh, of many others. I think on the other hand, um, I think Muslims have to also embrace the idea that they, they don't have the right not to be offended. So you're, everyone should have the right to draw a cartoon even if it's fundamentally offensive to Muslims. So I think the principle here should be freedom. And when you ban people from wearing the headscarf or you ban people from, or trying to ban them from drawing offensive cartoons, that is fundamentally illiberal. And I think what's really ironic is that European liberals who claim to be animated by these post-enlightenment ideals, they are going around trying to ban people from expressing their fundamental rights. It is a fundamental right to cover your hair, and no government should intervene in that. And I think that's a principle that should be absolute, but in Europe it is not absolute today. Ja, vielen Dank. Ich glaube, jetzt kommen wir näher an die Spannungen an. Ich denke, wir kommen näher zu den Tensionen. Sie sind jetzt auch klar in der Luft. Ich würde gerne Ihnen bitten, etwas kürzer zu sein, um die Antworten zu geben. Ich würde gerne Ihnen bitten, etwas kürzer zu sein, um die Antworten zu geben. Ich würde gerne Ihnen bitten, etwas kürzer zu sein, um die Antworten zu geben. Ich würde gerne Ihnen bitten, etwas kürzer zu sein, um die Antworten zu geben. Ich würde gerne Ihnen bitten, etwas kürzer zu sein, um die Antworten zu geben. Ich würde gerne Ihnen bitten, etwas kürzer zu sein, um die Antworten zu geben. Ich würde gerne Ihnen bitten, etwas kürzer zu sein, um die Antworten zu geben. Ich würde gerne Ihnen bitten, etwas kürzer zu sein, um die Antworten zu geben. Ich würde gerne Ihnen bitten, etwas kürzer zu sein, um die Antworten zu geben. Ich würde gerne Ihnen bitten, etwas kürzer zu sein, um die Antworten zu geben. Ich würde gerne Ihnen bitten, etwas kürzer zu sein, um die Antworten zu geben. Ich würde gerne Ihnen bitten, etwas kürzer zu sein, um die Antworten zu geben. Ich No headscarves, but uh, it's not only a question of uh, forbidding um, Islamic practices, but also Christian symbols. There was a case of uh, an employee of British Airways who was uh, dismissed because uh, she had a cross on and she didn't want to take it off. So I'd like to ask you, uh, Rabbi Goldschmidt, you said in an article uh, in a newspaper recently, you said that you think it's... Uh, it, if, if we want to, it's also ideological if we want to ban everything religious. This is also a trend in Europe, the separation between state and church. How do you see those tensions? And why do you say it's just, it's, it's just as much ideological? There are many ways um, to define a secular state and the relationship between a secular state and uh, the state religion, or the religion of the majority. And I think many countries in Europe, each one has its own way of doing that. Uh, well, even though there is a separation between church and state in England, in the UK, um, there is no separation. It's a secular state, but there is no separation between uh, the queen is the head of the Church of England. Uh, in, uh, in France, we have uh, laïcité. 
So in the United States, uh, you have a separation, and on each dollar you have in God we trust. I think that um, we're going to have to redefine, as I would say, as Europe is becoming more religious. And uh, Europe is becoming more religious not uh, only because the influx of immigrants from other parts of the world. I think religion is playing a much bigger role in um, this century than last century. Last century was defined by secular movements, which created the biggest killing machines in history. And uh, in this century, religion is much more important again. And I think one of the reasons why we religious leaders are invited here to the World Economic Forum is also a sign that while we do not deal with making money, we have something to add as faith leaders, as leaders of different traditions. So I think that we have to find a new way to tolerate each other. And what, um, what uh, Dr. Locher has said, we have to be true. We have to be true to each other, and we have to give the same message which we, if we're sitting in an inter-religious dialogue and we're speaking to each other, when we go home to our constituencies, we should give the same message. Now, I believe that we have to be tolerant to any kind of dress, if it's a religious dress. And, however, if there are people preaching terrorism, people who are preaching hate in our midst, in Europe, they have to be stopped. Mm. There were terrorists each time I go to the airport and I have to take off my shoes. I think maybe one day we'll come and we're going to have to wear special pajamas when we go on a plane. <laughs> Who knows? I think what would have happened if a religious leader in the right time, in the right place, would have said the right word. Herr Eide, wird Europa religiöser? Is, das war die These von Herrn Goldschmidt. Is uh, Europe becoming more religious? Well, that's I, what I, I guess Rabbi Goldschmidt the, is saying. In the diversity theme, there is also the need to identify oneself. Uh, you know, it becomes more important. So it's probably at least an element of that. I, I think it's difficult to, to, to estimate statistically, but I think that, you know, when, when people are more aware about the fact that there are others around, you are more concerned about who are you and what are your role and what are your identity. I think, but I very much would like to underline this point that I think religious leaders have uh, several important roles and there's very good reason that they are invited here and to the World Economic Forum to, to, to discuss this role because in a sense, um, and I think it's particularly true for leaders of minorities and particularly for relatively recently arrived minorities to try also to be a kind of bridge and an interpreter between the societies, because of the larger society, what are the expectations, what are the limitations of, of how we can express, uh, you know, it, to the extent that we are sort of invading others, uh, our religious uh, uh, faiths and practices and so on, and how do we, how do we meet, and, and the kind of connection of religious leaders that you describe here in Switzerland, we've had it in Norway quite successfully for many years. Uh, initiated, I think, by an, a former bishop of Oslo, but with several re Muslim Jewish leaders involved, and others, you know, exactly saying that that we have a collective responsibility of trying to help our followers to interpret our role in this, you know, uh, ever-evolving society. Can I also add one more point, which I think these discussions are, are have always been important, but they're getting particularly important now that we are in a time of crisis, because the danger of trying to build politics on exclusiveness is going to be far higher in the decade that we have in front of us than the decade we have behind us because there is a lot of unemployment, there's a lot of you know, uh, uncertainty and insecurity about the future and people's, people's personal lives. And the experience from the last time we had the crisis of these dimensions from the 1930s was that the exploitation of purity uh, and, and the sort of the... Uh, the, 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 the critique of multiculturalism led to an extremely dangerous situation which then blew 
Europe apart. I'm not suggesting that exactly same thing would happen again, but we have some lessons which we have to sort of bring into this debate that it's not only that we have a current set of issues that we have to solve, but we have to prevent against the future where this is becoming a big political problem. And, and that's up to us as politicians to deal with, it's up to the general public to take their role in this, and of course it's up to religious leaders to play their part. Ein, eine Frage, die auch immer wieder diskutiert wird, ist die Rolle des Fundamentalismus, is the role dass sozusagen Religionen Friedensstiften sein können. Das wurde, glaube ich, sehr viel betont und gezeigt. Das große Projekt Weltetos von Küng ist so ein Projekt, das immer wieder herausgestrichen hat, wie die Religionen verbunden werden können. Aber da wurde immer betont, das sind nur nicht fundamentalistische Religionen oder nur nicht fundamentalistische Strömungen in dieser Art Friedensstiften sein können. Also immer wieder die Frage, was ist eigentlich das Problem mit dem Fundamentalismus? Wie können wir mit Fundamentalismen umgehen? Oder welche we, Formen von Fundamentalismus sind allenfalls unproblematisch? Or, uh, of Herr Khaled, Sie haben diesbezüglich interessante Positionen. Sie waren früher selber Muslimbruder und heute ein Prediger, der sehr liberale Thesen vertritt. Was ist für Sie ein gut verstandener themes. Fundamentalismus? Well, what is so a good kind of fundamentalism? Is there a good kind of fundamentalism? Does it exist? Yeah, let, let, let me tell you that uh, I believe that if you're talking about Europe again, the, the overlaps areas, the mutual points between Muslims and, uh, and the West, is many, many uh, points. I believe that the mutual points much more than the differences. So I claim if we uh, not push but encourage Muslims to find where is the best ways to be part of the society, not the best uh, integration, but to be part, this is our country, how you support and help this country. And if the faith can encourage Muslims and the Christian and Jewish in, in, in Europe, please look for the needs of the society, and this is the meaning of your faith. I, I think that where are the priorities of the society in Europe? This is the role of the faith in Europe, in Egypt, my country, in each place. Look for the priorities. For example, Muslims in UK. Muslims in UK have a lot of uh, organizations, charities, but I told them most of these charities for the sake of the Muslims in UK. Why not to find organizations for the sake and the needs of the British society? For example, we have in UK Islamic relief. Islamic relief looking for the sake of the society, not for the sake of only the Muslims as a minority. Mm -hmm. Why not to think like that? For example, we environment, why not to find a project, Muslims in UK or in Swiss or in Europe, do it this project with another organizations in Europe to work together as a one project for the needs of the society. I think this is the role of, the, of, of faith. And, and f for example, let me give you that uh, there is a, a speech for Prophet Muhammad. He said to walk, to support a poor family better than, than to stay in my mosque for 40 days to pray. Mm -hmm. So it's a microfinance project. Mm -hmm. He's talking about microfinance. Look, to do something, this is the meaning of your faith. This is my role, to encourage youth, do the, this is put your energy, put your faith in this channel for the sake of the society. Yeah, Herr Locher. Mr. Locher. Es gibt wenig, das uns derart stark verbindet über alle religiösen Grenzen hinweg wie das Problem des Fundamentalismus. Wir kennen es alle. 
Und das scheint mir auch dort so zu sein, dass wir all familiar with fundamentalism. Eine Religion ist von Natur aus fundamental, und wir müssen uns eine klare Distinction machen, denn eine Religion ist basically a fundamentalist religion. Sie wollen die letzten Worte geben. Sie ist primär nicht daran interessiert, das vis-à-vis gleich zu bewerten. Sie ist eben fundamental. Aber es ist eine kleine, wichtige Fundamental. Aber das ist ein fundamentalistisches Sein. Fundamentalistisch in der Religion nicht. Und ich bin es sagen, dass es nicht fundamentalist ist, dass die Religionen der Ursprung des Fundamentalismus sind. Es ist nicht so, dass die Religion der Fundamentalismus ist. Das ist nicht der Fall. Und Sie können sehen, dass die Repräsentativen hier und alle anderen Religionen, die ich mit Bildung, die 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 mit Bildung,
And the leadership um, I see today with, uh, with my colleagues here to my left shows promise and hope that this new European religious leadership is going to adapt, is going to find, create a new European Islam, which is go be going to be compatible with European values. Yeah, but uh, I, uh, I want to say something uh, regarding to Egypt, actually. Uh, maybe the, the image of uh, Egypt, we need to, to be clear and to, to, to give you the, the right uh, image about the Egyptian Muslim and the Christians. What I want to say that uh, last, last month, I knew that uh, 100 of Egyptian Muslim and the Christians, they working together for a microfinance project in the poor families, with the poor families in Egypt. And no one asked the others, what is your religion? Both of them working together. And I know many of Christians change their religion to be Muslims. I know them. And I know, as, as you said, some else. But I remember during the revolution in Egypt that who protects the church was the Muslims. Muslims during the revolutions was afraid about the churches. So we protect the churches. I know a lot of youth left their families to go to keep the church. This is uh, something great happened during the revolution. And maybe you saw something like that in the televisions. So the image of the Egyptian that they believe we can work together. And another point, who's right? In my opinion, right is the needs of the people. In 07, I asked the youth, please send me the youth, the, the Arab youth. Please send me your dreams for your country after 20 years from now. And we put 20 sectors, uh, education, uh, health, uh, coexistence, and we got 700,000 dreams. Yes, 700,000 dreams. And I asked them, please put the priorities of your dreams. Number one was, we need jobs. Number one wasn't, uh, we need to fight Christians. Number one wasn't, we need to be in a fight. This is, this is w what I'm sure it is not, uh, it is very clear. We need jobs. And number two was women empowerment. Women empowerment in the Middle East. So uh, it is not like, uh, <laughs> like uh, there is a, a big problem between Muslim and the Christian and the Ich möchte gerne noch einen letzten Punkt like ansprechen, bevor wir dann öffnen für das Publikum, das bestimmt auch Fragen hat. Ich möchte noch die Frage sure ansprechen well. like einer europäischen Leitkultur oder der Frage dessen, was dieser gemeinsame Kern sein könnte. What the, what could es wurde jetzt zum core Teil ähm, betont, dass in vielen religiösen that Bewegungen, in vielen Religionen movements, es feste Überzeugungen there gibt, is, there es gibt äh, Grundannahmen, es gibt Werthaltungen und ein uh, Problem, so hat es beispielsweise auch Tariq Ramadan, der bereits erwähnt wurde, schon, schon gesagt, besteht darin, dass wir in Europa vielleicht in vergessen Europe, haben, uns uh, auf unsere Wurzeln zu besinnen. To, uh, es wurde sogar zum Teil von einzelnen Theoretikern gesagt, uh, es gibt eine Ideophobie, also eine Angst vor den eigenen Wurzeln, nicht nur eine Angst, Angst vor dem Fremden, also eine ideology. Angst vor dem eigenen uh, oder eine Christophobie, Angst vor den roots. christlichen Wurzeln, eine Angst a davor, sich zurückzubeziehen auf, die, auf das eigene. And, uh, und je mehr wir diese Angst verspüren, uh, desto mehr haben wir natürlich Panik vor dem Fremden. Uh, das ist eine alte These und wir fürchten vor allem, dass wir das uh, das einem bei einem selber Stück weit dann auch fehlt. Herr Eider, die Frage an Sie, was könnte so ein... Bollwerk sein, was könnten uh, Werte sein, a, a basic, die wir in diese uh, Lücke stellen können, um uh, zu sagen, wir haben auch unsere that, Wurzeln the, und dann können wir einander vielleicht gap. besser we verstehen, wenn auch wir uns wieder auf unsere Wurzeln sehen. Ich glaube, es ist absolut wahr, dass wenn Menschen, die sich unsicher über ihre eigene Identität fühlen, mehr bereit sind, andere zu fürchten. Es ist leichter, zu tolerieren, wenn Sie sich sicher und sicher in Ihrer eigenen Identität und denken. Um, and, and, but I think the answer is very much that this has worked before. I mean, in Europe, we used to kill each other for being Protestant and, and Catholics and so on. Not that long time ago. We have a long history of doing it the wrong way. But modern Europe is very much the opposite of that and has deliberately been, been developed both culturally, 
uh, politically as a project, and I'm not talking on the European, European Union, but the broader sort of European political project is this unity and diversity where the, the, the pride is very much in our own tolerance, the pride is in our diversity. The, the good thing is that you can go to another European country and feel more or less at home because it's rather similar and you understand you know, the culture and so on quite easily. Uh, and I think to build further on that, on, on the premise that it has worked before, we have been able to, to assimilate and to, and, and to adapt to, to each other previously. I, I would like to introduce one point which I think is related to that, but very often overlooked when Europeans talk about Islam, is that we, we, we tend to talk about Islam related to people coming from the Arab world only, uh, or, or from pers person world. But there's a lot of Muslims in Asia, east of that. You know, for India, 150 million, I think. Uh, Indonesia, predominantly Muslim, one of the biggest countries in the world, uh, Bangladesh, uh, Malaysia, where a lot of this sort of mutual coexistence has established itself over hundreds of years. And if you go there, these are extremely prosperous countries. It, it, India is going, going to be the third most important country in the world for the rest of this decade. Indonesia is very, doing very well, and, and, and there's a lot of Muslims there. So, I mean, th this kind of um, coexistence, which, has been, which we are struggling with in Europe, because it's newer when it comes to the Muslim immigrant, actually has happened elsewhere quite successfully. Not that they're with, without any problems, but, but I think we should remember that part as well. I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned the word insecurity and also, Amr, you said jobs earlier. And it, I think it's interesting that we've been talking now for about 40 minutes and we haven't focused on the economic issues here. It's not just a matter of ideology. If you look at Arab and Muslim minorities yeah. throughout Europe, they are disproportionately poor and part of a, the lower class and have less access to good employment opportunities. So the economic becomes mixed with the ideological and sometimes it's difficult to distinguish between them. So to what extent is it an ideological problem and to what extent is it an economic problem? Because when people don't have those opportunities, when they do feel economically insecure, they tend to look inward and find strength in their own identity. Yeah, yeah. And it's not just the minorities, but it, as, as Europe has will have more and more serious economic challenges, you're going to have uh, those who are part of the majority culture yeah. also turning to right-wing groups yeah. because their economic needs are not being addressed. So it's on both sides. So we also have to think, what are the economic solutions to this? Möchte gerne Herrn Locher noch das Wort geben und dann öffnen wir die Frage. Und dann öffnen wir die Frage zu Paradoxerweise bin ich der Meinung, well, dass das Beste, was für Europa passieren könnte, could für alle Menschen in Europa, uh, aber auch für die Europe, muslimischen for Brüder und Schwestern, uh, our ist, dass die Christen and sisters, is that, uh, Christians become die more Christen Christian. sich besinnen darauf, if, uh, was in ihrem Evangelium uh, steht, realize what's wenn sie sich besinnen gospel, an die Grundwerte eines creed, gemeinsamen Lebens, wenn sie ihre eigene Tradition mit dem Nachbarn holen, weil sie keine andere haben so schnell, dann wechselt die religiöse Identität to change your religious identity that easily and those values are there and if that happens and if we go back to these values we won't have that same fear if a majority in this country continues to fear the foreigner then I think it's going to be bad for everyone and these tensions are not going to go away so go back to what, what is important for us what are our values let's look at our own traditions do we know our own traditions let's, uh, let's look at ourselves and if we can do that, if we go back to our own values, then I think we should be more open towards others. And I'm convinced that we shall also succeed in seeing that uh, the others, uh, the foreigners, have their own profits who have the same values. But I think we have to do this very openly and frankly, and let's not try and separate uh, what is already too separate. Thank you very much indeed for those interesting comments. And there is one question uh, here from the gentleman. Could uh, the person with the microphone give a microphone? to the gentleman, please, so that he can put his question. Please make your question short. Uh, don't make your own presentation. If you have a question for a particular gentleman on the panel, please say to whom your question is directed. 
das Otherwise, Ganze zusammen zu halten. Vielen Dank. Keep everything together. Ali Ganya, I work in uh, development assistance and I've worked a lot in India and Switzerland as a neutral country uh, has uh, delivered weapons to India and Pakistan. I'd like to come back to what Mr. Hamid and what Mr. Locher were saying. They said uh, that uh, the economic uh, issues are extraordinarily important, and I think uh, religions are being instrumentalized. I've seen this in India. People in India were very peaceful until, uh, uh, for reasons of poverty, because of economic reasons, the Muslims were stirred up against the Hindus and, uh, and, and vice versa. And then they started to fight each other. And that led to a considerable problem. And uh, the problem is that the gap between rich and poor is getting, uh, is getting bigger and bigger. So I think that's a question we really must address. My question is, why, why do we not have uh, the major representative of religion on this podium, the religion of money? And I think it would be great if we did have the Pope of money here, because then we could, uh, be, we could uh, bury all our religious colleagues problems because uh, money would solve all our problems. Where are, the, where are the common values among the monotheistic religions we have here? Uh, in, the, in Muslims, we know that there is uh, a ban on interest, and uh, they haven't had any uh, losses there. And if we weren't able to have interest in all monotheistic religions, wouldn't that be a good way of trying to close the gap between rich and poor? It's a question for Mr. Locher. Well, there were a lot of issues there. I'm not sure that uh, the religion of money is as sustainable as you think. We uh, represent uh, religions, and I think uh, religions are far older than uh, money because money is made and then it disappears again. The major holders of power always have uh, convictions, they have values, uh, they have uh, societies uh, which are based on beliefs and faith. And I think uh, economic uh, leaders uh, would uh, be making a big mistake if they think that religion is marginal. Uh, and I think uh, that would lead to greater differences. Now, asking me about uh, major economic uh, policies that we could pursue, and uh, I, I wouldn't, uh, I, I wouldn't um, uh, wish to pronounce about that, but I think uh, uh, I, I think uh, money should be uh, money should be distributed widely. But I think uh, religion should uh, preach uh, religious values and not talk about money. And then there was the issue of uh, interest, uh, taking interest. Could you say uh, something about that? Because that's part of uh, the, uh, uh, the gospel. Well, that's something which in our own tradition is uh, disputed. There are various ways of taking interest, and I think uh, we could have a discussion um, about uh, interest, but uh, I wouldn't like to have that discussion here this afternoon. There's a gentleman in uh, the middle there, please, and then somebody to his left. Ladies and gentlemen, I think uh, we ought to look at our own values in the Christian world. In uh, my holidays in Turkey, I had an experience when our Turkish guide uh, talked about his religion and tried to explain it and said that we in Switzerland uh, and uh, we, we knew about these issues of apples or bananas and uh, everyone nodded and I think no, we shouldn't uh, do that. If we don't know what we're supposed to be defending, if we don't know the Bible, then I think uh, we're on the wrong track. And I think uh, when he told us about the dervishes and what they wanted to achieve, and uh, they all wanted uh, to have access to Allah, then I think we ought to realize that we don't uh, only have a body, we also have a soul. And we also have a mind. And 
with that in mind, we also have contact with uh, the Almighty. And if we could find perhaps a parallel with the dervishes, between the dervishes and us, could I ask you to ask a question, please, or to summarize what you want to say? What question are you asking to whom? I'd simply like to say that I don't have a question. <laughs> <laughs> because you will all, always have questions. I'd like to make my contribution, and that was my contribution. And uh, if that's not enough, well, that's too bad. That was my contribution. The uh, gentleman behind you, please. Hans Pestalozzi, I have two questions. The first was not uh, raised, the problem of uh, the rule of law. And uh, Europe is characterized by the rule of law. And unfortunately, the Muslims, and uh, we know that in practically every country, they have their own law. And yet they don't obey the law of the state. Uh, they consider that Sharia law is more important than the rule of the state and the rule of the land. Now, the question is, what do you think, Mr. Hamid, about how a democracy can uh, reconcile itself with the Sharia law? Is that possible, Mr. Hamid? OK, well, um, first of all, that's an overgeneralization. Like, we can't say that Muslims value Sharia over the laws of their own country. I'm an American Muslim, and I've been part of the American Muslim community growing up, and we never had a problem with American laws. Uh, so we have to be very careful about what we're talking about here. That may be true for a minority of European Muslims, but I think if you look, the majority of European Muslims don't have a problem with, the, with laws as they currently exist. Now, the question of whether or not, um, uh, and there's also, not to get into this too much, but there's also a concept in Islamic tradition that if you're a minority living in a different land, you have to respect the laws of that country, and that's what's supreme. Now, if we're talking about, so is Sharia and democracy compatible, and that's obviously very relevant for the Arab world where we've seen Islamist parties rising in places like Egypt, Tunisia, Libya, and so on. And just, um, just last week, we had the results released that more than 70% of the Egyptian parliament went to Islamist parties. Now, you might say, well, that's pretty disquieting. That's kind of problematic. But actually, I think it's very encouraging that Islamists are participating in the democratic process, mm -hmm. and they're reconciling themselves to democracy. Why should there be a conflict there? And in Turkey, we have an, a, a party with Islamist origins that has been ruling Turkey for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And they've experienced incredible economic growth and incredible economic success as a result of that party's policies. So uh, it's not a very simple thing. I do think there is a tension between Islam uh, or Islam and Sharia and liberalism maybe. Maybe that's where there's an issue. So for example, you have Islamist parties in Egypt who are talking about restricting alcohol consumption. Now that might be illiberal, but it's democratic. If the majority of Egyptians want to ban alcohol, that is 100% democratic. And actually, in America, in the 1920s, we also <laughs> banned alcohol through the democratic process. So liberalism and democracy are sometimes going to be in, in tension, and sometimes you have to decide what do you value more. Ganz kurz, Herr Minister yeah, Eide. I, I, Minister Eide, very briefly. I think that developments in Turkey are extremely encouraging. It's going in a very interesting direction, and it may be the uh, one of the role models for many of many of the emerging Muslim states, recognizing certain differences and historical uh, issues. But I think there's something very interesting going on. And my other point there is that I think it's crucially important that we now sort of find, you know, allow this development in the Muslim world to the extent we have any influence and say, it's good that some of these parties like the Muslim Brotherhood is now you know, taking part in normal politics, because then you have to deal with normal budgets and normal trade-offs, rather than trying to be for, or, or having to be forced into the shadow of the mosque, where you have sort of a completely different uh, agenda. I think, the, you know, the democratization means that you have to deal with the issues we as normal politicians deal with every day, which is sort of 
difficult compromises between different you know, trade-offs, which, which uh, they, many of these people have not been allowed to simply because their authoritarian leaders were supported by us who thought that it was better to have an authoritarian leader than to have democracy because they might elect the wrong people. Yeah, Goldschmidt. I just would like to add also that uh, I think over 100 years or 130 years ago, in Europe they were asking the question if Christianity is compatible with democracy. Mm. I would like to add to it another one. I'm from Russia. I'm from Moscow. In 2004, the librarian of the Library of Congress, James Billington, wrote an article where he said that the Russian Orthodox Church is going to be a vehicle for increased democracy in Russia. Mm -hmm. Everybody laughed at him. And just a few weeks ago, after the big demonstrations in Moscow, it was the patriarch who intervened. So I think that everything is developing. We just need time, patience, and tolerance. Vielen Dank. Und mit diesem Votum ist vielleicht auch gerade ein guter Augenblick, dass wir Sie schon verabschieden And dürfen. Sie gehen ein bisschen früher, weil der Sabbat beginnt. Warmer Applaus für Sie, Herr Deutschmann. Vielen Dank, dass Sie hier waren. Danke vielmals. Alles gut. Thank you very much. All the best. Unsere Diskussion ist noch nicht ganz Our zu Ende. Wir werden noch bis kurz end. vor fünf weiter diskutieren, wenn Sie mögen. Weitere Fragen. Any further questions? Yes, here at the front in the third row, a lady. Where is the microphone? Where is the microphone? Thank you. Um. <laughs> das ist jetzt ein Regiefehler, aber dann ja, wenn Sie zuerst. Yes, please continue. Okay. Um, 10, 20, 30 years ago the debate might have been about racial prejudices and racial tensions, whether here in Europe or in the USA. Today we're talking about religious tensions. Yeah. 20, 30 years' time, God knows what tensions we'll be talking about. Isn't it really the issue that it's discrimination, prejudice, and ignorance that exists among us all? And that's the real issue that we should be debating. And if we solve these kind of issues, then ho hopefully there'll be peace amongst all nations. Thank you. Geht Ihre Frage an eine bestimmte Person? Are you addressing your question to someone in particular? To, to all of them. <laughs> Who was, would you like to answer? I can just say something very briefly on that. I mean, I think we also have to face the reality that these tensions are never going to be resolved. It's part of the human condition that we find ways to hate and dislike each other. So, I mean, it would be nice to think about some ideal scenario where that would be the case, but it's simply not possible. I mean, even in the U.S., we thought that once we elected the first black president, that, yes, we had finally reached a promised land. But in some ways, we've seen since then how anti-black sentiment has been on the rise. And you see a lot of veiled attacks on President Obama from the Republican Party that touch on his foreign origins and questioning how true he is to American identity. So... Even, I think the point here is even if you take two steps forward, you're probably going to end up taking a step back too. And you just have to keep on fighting and hope that you'll at least be able to have forward momentum in the right direction. Can I? Frau Locher? Ich glaube auch, wir sollten hier nicht hinter die Religionen schauen wollen. I don't think we should want to look behind the religions here. These attitudes, these negative developments, they have their roots. And you could perhaps lose sight of the religions um, and just think that all you need to do is overcome prejudice. I don't think that's true. We need to look at the content. We need to look at the issues of religion. We need to look at our own religions and uh, not lose sight of them. Um, as another member of the panel has said, alongside with the religious and social factors, there are economic factors as well. These are facts, and we can look at these facts individually. I think the question is, is very good, because it's true that in, in principle, any difference can be exploited politically. 
I, I worked quite a lot on the Balkans during the wars in the former Yugoslavia, and you could saw that very minor differences that people hadn't thought about at all, you know, 10 years earlier suddenly became very big to the extent that Serbo-Croat, which is basically one language, was then distinguished so that you can have a Serbian versus Croat dictionary with the same words on both sides of the column. Uh, you know, so any difference can, can be a political theme if people make them. And in that case, it was not age-old hatred as people thought. It was deliberate contemporary politics of hatred and difference. So in that sense, you know, maybe in 10 years or 20 years, we have a, a, diff a debate about... Uh, you know, injustice among different kind of, 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 of delineators. I would just make the point that having observed the World Economic Forum and for, for several years now, there is more and more recognition of the values of equity and equality in growth and that the growth should be inclusive. There's much more talk about that now than 10 years ago. I think 10 years ago there was much more talk about that than 10 years earlier. That, you know, that the just economic growth on its own is not desirable if it is not checked by certain sort of values and equity. First, because it sort of reduces tensions if it works. I mean, if you have more equity, there will be less conflict. Mm. But also simply because it's a more sustainable growth. So, I mean, the point you're making is very good, and it is a good reminder that what seems to be religious difference may actually sometimes be actually something else. What would be of interest for me, I think we haven't really discussed religion uh, extensively enough. I think um, every religion has its own competitive approach. You know, there tends to be a competition between the religions um, in Switzerland, you have tithes. This church gets money from the uh, government. It wants a certain number of participants. The churches want um, people not to convert. And I think it's the same in Islamic countries. I think in the Islamic countries, there is large amount of uh, a large number of converts to Christianity sometimes. How do religions deal with that? Uh, they, need, they might recognize the need to be tolerant, but they also have to um, pursue their own interests. So I might, I might, as a Christian, say I tolerate Muslims, I, I tolerate uh, Jews, but every believer believes that their religion is the right one. And they want their leaders. Well, I think your question is clear. You want to know to what extent uh, the churches can reconcile their needs to convert with um, and pursue their own interests with tolerance. Sie möchten die Frage nicht, dann gebe ich sie weiter an Herrn Hallett. Question, Hallett. Ein heißes Eisen offenbar. If, 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 if I'm talking about Islam, it's very clear. There is a verse of Quran very clear, don't push anybody to change or to leave his, uh, his religion. Or if he wants to be in another religion, don't push him to be in your religion. It's very clear for us as a Muslims that we respect if someone wants to change his religion. And I'm talking about myself and I'm talking about a lot of uh, Muslims. We have no problem about this point. Yes, some people have some understanding to these verses that no, it is not, uh, it is not correct, but most of the Muslims in the Arab countries believe now that no problem because the verse is la ikraha fiddin. Don't push anybody for any religion. It's a freedom to each one to choose his religion. Hello, 
Und trotzdem haben sie recht. Mr. Locher, genau so ist but at the same time you're right. That's the way things are. Religions wouldn't be religion if they didn't claim the truth. And when we recognize that, we recognize how uh, large the problem is. Because you have different systems, each claiming to possess the truth. It's not about something which is distant from us, about something that is far away from us. It's a question of how how we deal with gender, with minorities, with our children, it relates to the way we live day to day. There was a time when we thought that could perhaps be ignored, or overlooked, but what Rabbi Goldschmidt said is right. There are pressing questions, and the issue of tolerance must also go hand with hand with an assessment of how honest that approach is. We have an obligation to pursue peace between religions, but we need to make that small difference between fundamental and fundamentalism. If a religion is honest, it is fundamental, but if it is fundamentalist, then it is working against its own fundamental principles, at least those that I believe. Another question here at the front, a, a lady in the third row. Maybe we should take two questions together. Here. Und danach noch diesen Herrn hier auf dieser Seite. And then the gentleman here on this side. Hi, um, I had a question from an international relations um, point of view. Um, in my classes and tutorials, we often talk about system-defining dates, such as 1648 with the introduction of state sovereignty and secularization of the state, or 1945 with the introduction of United Nations and institutions. Um, I was wondering whether you might argue that 2001 and 9-11 um, with the response, the war on terror, whether you might be able to argue that that is a first step towards what Samuel Huntington called a uh, clash of civilizations. And that's a question directed to all of you. Thank you very much. I'd like to hear the nehmen. question from uh, this gentleman. My name is Urs, or uh, Fleur. I'd like to say, we all have a father and a mother. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. Hm. And in the, over the last few millennia, we've had the same fathers, uh, the Creator, Adam and Noah. Then why is it not possible to live in peace and respect with one another? And uh, in light of the Gospels, what is the message there? What will help us to do that? So the class of civilizations and the Huntington theory, could I offer you th uh, this question? Yeah. Um, well, I think um, Huntington's thesis has been discredited. I, I don't think, um, we don't take it as seriously as we may have some time ago, and I think that's positive. And that said, I think he touches on some things in the article and then the book, which do have some truth that ideology matters, values matter, and we're not all going to become the same. I mean, but the, the academic article that I associate myself with more is Francis Fukuyama's End of History, and I think those are two of the most influential articles of our time, where essentially Fukuyama argues that history is moving towards an end point where all of us are going to accept democracy. To some extent, that's what he's arguing. And I think that's what's actually really encouraging post 9-11, that democracy has become um, the universal language, that even if we're Islamists, secularists, liberals, leftists, that's a direction that people want to go in. And right now in the Arab world, they're dying mm. in the hundreds and, fight, and millions are, are willing to die for that freedom and democracy. So you can have a guy with a really big beard, one of these Salafis, who's in Tahrir Square saying, I want my freedom, I want my democracy, and I'm willing to participate in a democratic process where we resolve our differences peacefully through a political process. To me, that is the defining change 
of this era, and that's what makes me optimistic. I, I agree with that. I think Huntington's uh, thesis has been discredited. I think that's, that's true. I think there were, there were different reactions after 9-11, and some of them were quite good. There was an increasing cooperation of police intelligence, which actually did prevent certain, certain further attacks. But the other part was very dramatic. That was the, the willingness to allow the terrorists to define our agenda for several years, where a lot of Western countries, led by the previous U.S. administration, in a sense, ex accepted this to become a, a, a defining moment in a way that you don't really have to because you can respond differently. When, when we had the 22nd of July in Norway last year with this attack on that we had, which is our, in, to, adapted to scale, is our 9-11, it was a very strong sentiment not to allow the terrorists to decide what we, what's on our agenda, to try to make things stay the same as much as possible. Of course, there's certain things you have to do, but within the principle and ideas and values that was already existing. And, and in, our, in our case, I think that was a successful choice because we actually got more of what we had rather than less of what we had when it comes to certain balances between individual freedoms and, 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 and state security and so on. Ich möchte noch zwei letzte kurze Fragen Can berücksichtigen. Two, uh, perhaps two Herr, last short questions. Uh, the gentleman at the back and then there's uh, one lady here in the grey dress. Well, perhaps a thought experiment. What do you, how do you think the discussion would have gone on the podium when, or if a woman were here not just as a moderator but rather as a religious representative? <laughs> I'd keep my question short. It's Mr. Khaled. He said that one of the most important points is having a job. Would that not, ju not just be putting religious questions on the back burner, though? Would that, not, would that just be ignoring religious questions if we focused on the economy? No, 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 no. <laughs> I, 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 I think that... It, Religious now and faith now, talking about faith without talking about economy and the role of the faith to in, in the recession and the, in, in this period, the world, all the world thinking about how we will live, how we will, this is, I believe that this is the role now about faith to encourage the people through the faith to do something for our future, to, for the economy. This is what I, uh, I believe. There is a big relation between how to live, between economic and the spiritual leaders and the spiritual role to encourage the people to live in a better future. Uh, according to uh, your, uh, to Hamid point about the, um, why the people, why we are not going to make a clash now in this uh, period, I think people in the Arab world now want to live, want to eat want to find a better future. So they're talking about coexistence. It's very clear now, coexistence is, the, uh, is, the, is our way. So this is, this is a relation, in my opinion. Mm. And perhaps um, we can hone that question, because earlier you were speaking about 9-11. That was um, the amazing thing, that the attacks didn't come out of a climate of poverty, that many of the terrorist attacks um, rise in prosperous areas or rather the, the perpetrators are, are not poor. So maybe there's confusion um, when, when you say we need to resolve the economic issues. And if you say many religious issues might uh, actually be economic issues on the surface, there seems to be some paradox there. Right, yeah. Well, poverty, that's why addressing poverty is not going to end extremism. Extremism mm. is still going to be there, fundamental, fundamentalism is going to be there even if everyone was rich. So I think we, yeah, exactly, we shouldn't simplify this and say once you give people a job, they're going to be happy. And actually, historically, if you look at the most ideological movements, the radical movements, not just in the Middle East, but also in Europe, mm. they tend to come from a middle class or upper middle class background, at least the leadership. Maybe the rank and file is different, 
But the leaders of these movements are actually often quite well educated. And there's been a number of very interesting studies. If you look at Hamas, Hezbollah, Islam, you know, whatever it is, mm. that um, these are people, many of them, the leaders, with PhDs, doctors, engineers, and so on. Um, the number two in Al-Qaeda is a doctor. Uh, so, I, I mean, I think, um, and I think uh, here... I think the basic problem if you're trying to understand this is what edu as people become more educated, they have higher expectations. But then their needs aren't able to be satisfied, mm -hmm. so you have what we call a gap between want satisfaction and want formation. It's a political science thing, but generally you want more, but you can't get it, so you're angry. And that's where I think a lot of this comes from. But I think the bottom line is you have to have an integrated approach. Addressing poverty is not going to be enough. And I think we should be careful not to say that, yes, all Egyptians want jobs, all Egyptians want a better life, but also a lot of Egyptians may want to ban alcohol or may want to see Islam play a larger role in public life or may want to see in their ideal world the hands of thieves being cut off. You can want both of those things at the same time. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we have to draw our discussion to close. Perhaps uh, right at the end, I could draw two or three things together that uh, come from our discussion. One, uh, you said certainly the clashes, the tensions are not only between religions, but rather between also between the secular societies and religious uh, societies. We as Europeans uh, perhaps, perhaps are have to ask whether we're pushing secularization too far. And then the idea of people who know themselves, who know their own identity, are likely to be less afraid of others who express their own identity and push their own identity forward. So again, we have to look within ourselves for our own identity, ask what is our culture and how do we understand our culture in Europe. And something that will certainly remain with me um, is the hopeful sign that uh, you touched upon, namely that the Islamic parties which have been elected to parliaments in uh, Arab countries are involved in the democratic process. So that's not a cause for concern, but rather a cause for hope. Thank you very much to all of you for your commitment, for your questions. Thank you for coming. And also, I'd like to offer the warmest of thanks to the participants in the panel who have really contributed to a very rich discussion. Please give them warm applause.